Well, welcome. Uh, we still we have some. The bell's gone, so you're late. <laughs> <So, laughs> have, have a seat. Uh, anyway, thank you for coming. Oh, okay. I have to speak into the microphone. So. <laughs> is it on? Uh, it's on. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, thank you for coming. Um, first thing, uh, we've got some exciting uh, guest speakers tonight, uh, so we'll get to those in a few minutes. I'm going to go through some uh, slides just on our association and what we've got coming up. Uh, the first thing you might notice, if you've been here before, we're now called the Ontario Ancestors. That was to uh, get rid of the confusion between, uh, if you, we always called ourselves the OGS. Well, is that the Ohio Genealogical Society? Is that the Oklahoma Genealogical Society? So there was some confusion uh, when you're doing, you know, typing that into the internet. And, uh, so we've gone with an, uh, Ontario Ancestors as our uh, marketing name. And uh, so we hopefully it's a little bit more understandable. People won't confuse uh, genealogy with gynecology and uh, that kind of thing. So. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're hoping that. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, just just was launched in February uh, out at the, the Roots Tech. So uh, very exciting. Um, let me uh, the, hopefully I got this. Okay. Uh, we're video recording this just so that we can uh, put it on uh, the internet on uh, YouTube so that people that don't live in the area are able to, to look at it. We have quite a few members that don't live in Windsor in Essex County, so that uh, gives them that idea. So so. Um, these are our websites. Uh, I think most people uh, are following our Facebook site to uh, find out what the events are. Uh, does everyone know where, how to find an event on Facebook, by the way? Or? No. Uh, yeah, uh, so you go, if you go to the, the Facebook site itself, on the left-hand side, uh, there should be a menu and it'll say events. So if you press events, then it'll, it'll show you where the, uh, the next, what we have coming up. And speaking of what's coming up, <laughs> Uh, I think it's on some of the slides coming up, but we'll, if they aren't, I'll get back to this one. So, yeah, I think uh, you've got them. So, okay. but we have a little uh, handout back there for all the upcoming events as a reminder. Um, okay, so the April meeting is going to be. Uh, we have Tilbury <laughs> District um, Historical Society are coming down uh, from Tilbury. Uh, we had a tour there last year. It was quite nice. They have a nice little museum if you're ever there and I think mainly they're open on Saturdays that's one day uh, Wednesday afternoons I think what just Wednesday yeah okay. they open so, Saturday for us as uh, that's special. What it was. I knew we were there so um, but nice little museum especially if you have French heritage they, they've got quite a bit of French uh, uh, information there um, so they're here next month so that's kind of exciting for us because uh, and then in May we have the uh, French genealogical society coming uh, and they're going to talk about the daughters of the kings um, uh, over time, so uh, Agatha, uh, from her uh, her uh, French genealogical society is on uh, Prince and College, uh, so they're not coming too far across town. Um, and actually, now that it, now that I mention it, uh, Agatha actually arranged for us to move our uh, backup collection to the Maryville facility. So, uh, um, so all of our uh, backup collection is now housed there because of the French genealogical society. Uh, and Maryville is a great spot. And starting in September, we're going to be having our meetings, these presentations at Maryvale uh, on the first floor. So we've just organized that as well. Uh, Maryvale has been really helpful for us and, and got us out of a, uh, a bit of a tough spot because we didn't know where we were going to be meeting. This, this facility is sold as of June, so everyone has to move out. And uh, that's part of us. So, so you'll be hearing more about uh, September meetings being at Maryville and how to get there and parking. And uh, we're going to start at 6:30, I, I believe, at uh, Maryville, uh, but on a Tuesday night, not a Monday, uh, because the French Genealogical Society is open on a Tuesday. So we wanted to sort of match up with them. So, so you'll hear more about that as we go on. Um, June, we're going to go to the Burton Collection. Uh, we were there about uh, six. So seven years ago, uh, we had a, uh, a group tour over to the Burton Collection at the Detroit Public Library. So uh, we're going to have carpooling, and you'll again hear more about that uh, as we get better organized, I guess. So, uh, but that's always uh, uh, if you've got anybody that lives in, uh, in Michigan area, that's a good place to start. Um, the the next big thing is the conference coming up in June. Uh, we have flyers back there about the conference. You might want to pick that up. Uh, the marketplace or the trade show where you get all the deals on uh, ancestry and my heritage and all these kinds of things uh, is free to attend. 
Uh, but if you want to get in any of the educational uh, things, it's going to cost you. Uh, right now, it's a deal for the whole weekend for $130, so that's not too bad. I think your hotel room is going to cost you more than that. But uh, uh, it's um, uh, for people in Chatham, that, uh, it's probably you could uh, go there on a daily basis. But uh, anyway, it's always worthwhile. That's one of the biggest things of being a member of OGS is the, the conference. Um, so tonight we've got, uh, um, I think, a double header. We have Tim Sellens from the uh, Italian Genealogical and Heritage Society of Canada, uh, which is located in Kingsville. That's where their collection is, and apparently it's the biggest nonprofit collection of uh, genealog genealogical society uh, uh, reference books and things like that. And Tim's in a minute is going to give us a, uh, a talk or give you an idea of what. Um, they do and what kind of collection. Then we're going to have uh, uh, another speaker uh, from Farmington Hills, I believe, yeah. you're, you're living in. Um, Dan uh, Ventor. I uh, heard Dan speak in Detroit last year at the Detroit Society of Genealogical Research and it was fantastic. And so he's uh, agreed to come over and give us basically the same talk. Um, and I think you're going to find it very, very informative, especially if you have any roadblocks. Uh, from genealogical, we have we have someone's got to have their hand up quite regularly. Uh -huh. so, uh, anyway, let me uh, bring Tim up if you would. He's had a bit of a, a, a sore throat, so he'll struggle through it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Uh, you have to forgive my horse throat, but it figures when you want to do a talk, then you get laryngitis. And, don't know why it works out that way. But anyway, uh, my name is Tim Sellen. I'm the president of the Italian Genealogy and Heraldry Society of Canada. I always got to take a breather after I say that name. Uh, we were established in 1992 by uh, three fine individuals, Flavio Andriotta, who is the key genealogist who really is the core of everything, and also Dan Marcus, or Marcus, uh, and uh, he is um, a part owner of uh, Herald Press on University by Karen. And Dino Coletti, these are the three amigos who got us started back in 92. And by the way, this is just a little hello, how are you? It's not really a formal presentation. I'll try and come up with something more meaningful later on in the year. Uh, I have to apologize as our genealogist Flavio uh, would be here, but he's taken ill, so I'll have to just settle for a brief introduction and then let Dan take over. Anyway, our, our Italian Genealogy and Heraldry Society of Canada is a nonprofit charitable cultural and educational organization dedicated to the promotion, preservation and study of Italian genealogy and heraldry, which of course is court of arms. And I believe uh, that uh, we're kind of unique in this situation. Uh, we are, I believe uh, we have the largest uh, research library of Italian genealogy and heraldry uh, for a nonprofit uh, charity anywhere in the world outside of Italy. And uh, we, we offer you know, the basic services like genealogy and family history research. Uh, of course, Flavia does that, he's the expert. And of course, heraldry, coat of arms. Uh, we have uh, meetings at the Fogelar uh, every, uh, every first. Um, first uh, Tuesday of the month and, and but right now that's suspended because of uh, our president not being available uh, due to his health uh, but he normally would then give uh, lectures and help people with genealogy memberships $50 a year and, but he does a lot of research for you for for that money we're not making money and of course we do uh, uh, try to do events we started off at the Kabodo many years ago and, um, and, but you know, eventually uh, we get tired of them, they get tired of us. We moved on to the Chicharo, then spent a few years with them. Now we're at the Fogelar. Makes the most sense for us to be at the Fogelar because most of us are from the Friuli uh, area in the Northeast. And of course, the Fogelar is all about Friuli immigrants, right? So it makes sense that we would uh, be there. And of course, we have uh, our research library and museum. And so uh, our, our nonprofit charity is technically classified legally as, as a library and museum. It's not like one of those libraries and museums like here where you just walk in. No, you, you'd have to make an appointment and be a member and then 
uh, Flavio might be able to help you find what you want. But uh, you know the resources there are very technical. Some are are in Italian or old Italian or Latin or God knows what. So you need his expertise, or else you wouldn't be able to do anything in that library. Okay, uh, we're located currently uh, uh, in Kingsville in the basement of his home, but we're moving to a new home a couple of blocks away. So that's always fun. Uh, because uh, the library itself, never mind the house, the library is two, over 2,000 books, maps, and uh, countless items of memorabilia. There's thousands of families in this database. Uh, we have display cases, memorabilia, art, actual physical shields, and, and flags. So we have all sorts of crazy stuff. I'll let you take a little look. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, well, right now, everything's in boxes. But uh, this is uh, the, uh, the main library. Um, that looks a little bit squished, or maybe it's just the angle I'm looking at. Oh, well, it looks better on here. Uh, okay, <laughs> but uh, as you can see, uh, we have like a bookshelf there. That's like um, 10 bookcases across, six shelves of bookcase, plus a long uh, ca cabinet for memorabilia and maps along the side. And then there's more in the back. Uh, uh, like here's one of the memorabilia cases. Uh, any sort of memorabilia that's of historical interest he'll try to obtain. A lot of that stuff came off eBay. And you can see the refraction of the light from the ceiling. Uh, <laughs> that's not a memorabilia, but uh, it's all historic memorabilia, a lot of it from World War II. Uh, here's uh, another case, for example, uh, with memorabilia in it and uh, some coat of arms uh, artwork and other statues on top. And that's the sort of thing he collects, uh, so hence it's a library and it's a museum. Uh, so you, and actually, this particular case is uh, going up for sale because it won't fit in a new house. <laughs> the other one can be dismantled, but uh, so anyway, uh, so that looks uh, quite nice. And gee, it takes so much time to collect. This is basically he's been collecting since oh, you know, before the 1990s. So uh, it's really um, taken some time. This is his office, so you know he's got a lot of desk space and. That'll be fun getting into a new house. Uh, and uh, so he's got a lot of files, file space for, for paperwork on genealogy and all that. And uh, so uh, this is what it's like there. This is the coat of arms for our society. It's the official coat of arms done by uh, a heraldic artist in, uh, in Italy. I believe it's Massimo Girardi, I think his name is. I think there's only two of them left. So. Uh, he, he, that's the uh, Italian eagle, uh, and our, our official color is azure blue. And you can see the ribbon on the left is red, white, and green, obviously representing uh, the flag of Italy. And on the right, you have red, white, red, which is uh, representing Canada. Uh, um, so that's uh, our official coat of arms. And this is my personal Selwyn family coat of arms. Now, coat of arms are more tricky than you think. Uh, in order to get your authentic coat of arms, you have to trace your genealogy back to its source. And then you have to look for uh, coat of arms records. Usually it's just a description called a blazon or blazon of arms. So it'll describe, usually in Italian, old Italian, it'll describe uh, what, what it looks like. And then you get, uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, you get a, a real heraldic artist like Massimo Girardi uh, to reproduce the uh, coat of arms based on the description uh, according to the official rules of heraldic art. And then you get an official uh, coat of arms that's actually really yours, okay? Because you traced it back to your, to your ancestors' uh, place of origin and you got the appropriate record. And if you lucked out, you'll get a picture of it, but not everybody gets that. <coughs> uh, according to Flavio, you know, there's been so much uh, cross-mixing between noble, the, the nobility and, um, uh, and the, the commoners and the artisans that if you're of Italian ancestry, you got about a 75% chance of having a coat of arms in, in your family. It's just a matter of finding it. But uh, don't, don't believe much of anything about coat of arms on the internet. Awful lot of baloney on the internet. You know, if somebody says, this is your coat of arms, don't believe it. Okay, especially if it comes from the internet. 
Does he make up crap all the time? It's just ridiculous. Uh, I don't know where you can get that sort of thing. And, and yes, colors and patterns and, and, and icons have a meaning, but in Italian heraldry, it's not really standardized. So I, I'll probably never know what these colors and, and symbols and, and patterns mean. Okay, it can mean one thing in one shield and something different in another. Um, um, given the, the colors of the yellow and black, maybe the guy was a beekeeper, I don't know. But uh, uh, yellow represents gold, so it's really gold and, and, and black, uh, so that it'll, it'll say gold in the description, or the blazon. Uh, what the heck it means, I don't know, but it sure looks pretty. So, so at least I'm happy I got an official coat of arms and it's not phony. <laughs> okay. And uh, of course we have events, uh, like when we were, well we started off at Kubota, I, I lost the pictures for that, I can't find it now, <laughs> Damn, I don't know where that went. But anyway, when we moved to the Chicharo, we had uh, Festa di Noni, a Grandparents Day Festival, and um, uh, Anna Serini, who was a member there, was our chairman at the time, and she helped organize the event, and so it'd be a big dinner of around 200 people, we do skits on the stage, and music videos, it was pretty fun, we had a good fundraiser. And uh, then when we moved to the Chicharo, or no, uh, to the Fogelar, uh, then uh, I tried doing um, uh, like a holiday fest, wine and food thing, where you have the local uh, wine people and food people and do a little bit of a fundraiser, uh, not that big. But it was fun uh, drinking and eating. Uh, then uh, in 2016, uh, we, we did a couple of uh, freely fest dinners at uh, Fogelar. Uh, they were they were nice. We talk about uh, you know topics pertaining to uh, Friuli, and you can see in the corner here um, actual heraldic shields, physical shields that a tinsmith named uh, Mario Testani, who was a member at the time, uh, he physically built those uh, and painted it, and it comes with a crossbar in the back so you can pick it up and you know defend yourself in case of an attack. And uh, the actual uh, authentic shields. I don't think anybody else has one. I don't know. Uh, but those are pretty cool. You can defend yourself uh, against your spouse uh, throwing stuff at your head, so it comes in handy. So uh, that's quite interesting. And uh, then, of course, uh, in 2017, we had the 25th anniversary dinner. And um, in the top left corner, uh, that's Dan Marcus on the left, Flavia Andriotta in the middle, uh, Dino Coletti on the right, and me and Dan, since he's at Herald Press, we, we conspire to give um, Flavio... Uh, uh, an award there for 25 years of, uh, of service because uh, he pretty much built that library himself. And of course, all the usual group pictures and salutations and commendations go with an anniversary dinner. Uh, but now, uh, uh, well, this is our Christmas pizza party 2018. Uh, you know, at uh, Kaboto, I think we had like uh, 400 people uh, at, a, at a big uh, banquet event. At the Chicharo, well, usually around 200, but at, at the Fogelar, you're lucky to get 65 because they don't have that many active members anymore. Uh, you know, um, but uh, so anyway, we're kind of down to having a pizza and wine party now. Uh, you don't raise much money, but it's a lot of fun. So uh, we, we kind of like that. Uh, but anyway, that's really all I got to say. Uh, you can contact me anytime, uh, Tim Sellen, president. Uh, you can contact me at tim.sellen at gmail.com. Uh, our, our, the website is oghsc.org, which is, um, um, oh shoot, that's supposed to say IGHSC, Italian Genealogy and Heraldry Society of Canada, not O, it's I, geez, I gotta pay attention. Gotta see there, uh, IGHSC, so on Facebook, if you go to the groups, I think it's groups, plural with an S, another mistake. Okay, and then the IGHSC, or just search for IGHSC on Facebook and click on the resulting link and you go to our Facebook page, and uh, so uh, I don't put that much up there because I'm the only one willing to do the work. So, uh, but anyway, that's basically it. Um, so here, I'll give this back to you, and you can get a real genealogist up here. Thank you. Uh, Tim, thanks very much. Um, any questions uh, for Tim? We, he'll be around later. And, and sure, sure. He's, yeah. here, he's here all night. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, Dan uh, Fentori, uh, did I pronounce that right? Uh, or? It's Americanized Italian. It should be Fornitaro. Oh, okay. It was changed. I appreciate it. <laughs> Daniel with a D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Buongiorno. Parli italiano? I'll do it in English then. Okay, we'll talk English. Uh, let me see if I get the right one. Uh, this is me. Uh, this is in my grandpa's hometown of Coliano in Salerno. Uh, I started researching in 1995 and I started on my mom's German side in the thumb of Michigan, Port Hope. And then I started researching my Italian side. Uh, my grandparents, Lucia Pepe and Paolo Fornataro, came to Detroit around 1945 from Pennsylvania. Uh, I've got my Italian ancestry back to the 1700s. I think I got one back in the 1600s. I've researched for Italian clients. Uh, I had a, client, a really good client. Uh, his family's from Calabria. I used microfilms in the old days. Remember microfilms? We go to the library and uh, do that research. I was a volunteer family historian at the, uh, or a family librarian, history librarian at the Family History Center in Annandale, Virginia for eight years. And I did receive my certification as a genealogical record specialist. I have let that lapse, but it was a great education. So this is uh, a, a statue uh, in my grandfather's hometown of someone who left, uh, put up the statue uh, to immigrants because so many Southern Italians left Italy and uh, just decimated the towns, the, the populations really went down. Uh, but this was a tribute to the immigrant. So this is my uh, Paolo Fornitaro, my nonos. Uh, family history uh, or ancestry. I ha actually have more on this uh, another generation or two. But I started, uh, and this is the way I got this uh, primarily at the beginning, was writing to my grandfather's hometown. And this is my grandmother's. Again, writing to Italy, uh, back to Bella Squardo. And uh, I actually got to Bella Squardo and I met the, uh, the mayor there, the Sindaco, and same last name as my grandmother, Nick Pepe. And he let me go through the books and you know, it's, there's, it's uh, nothing like holding those original records. So a little background on it Italian immigration and I, I apologize, my, my uh, Concentration is on the, in the U.S. Uh, Canadian research is not my forte, uh, but I think we're going to go through the same process. Uh, and you'll see most of the Italian, uh, about 5.5 million Italian Italians immigrated to the U.S. Primarily, uh, well, it says 1820. Most of it's after 18, after the Civil War. Most of it after 1880, and actually most of it after 1900. Uh, I, I'm not sure about how this relates to Canadians, because I've heard that, uh, at least in Windsor, there's a significant population of Northern Italians mm -hmm. in Windsor. In America, it is 90% Southern Italians. Uh, and 17% of Americans claim Italian ancestry, but so many more want to. <laughs> Uh, and about a third, when they were coming over, about a third of the Italian immigrants said, uh, we're going to go back to Italy. Some did, not all of them, but some did. This is uh, my grandfather's uh, steamship. Uh, he came over in 1910. Uh, everyone been to Detroit? Mm -hmm. Okay. Most of the uh, Italians were on the east side. You know, Gratiot, Gratiot was Italian central. Uh, Italians lived on either side of Gratiot. Uh, this is my, uh, my dad's first cousin. The guy in the uniform is my dad's first cousin's husband, my confirmation sponsor. And uh, that, that, I'm pretty sure that's on Gratiot. Uh, a little uh, interesting about the first Italian to Detroit was Alfonso Tonti, who arrived with Cadillac. Uh, the first, I think this was the first Europeans in, uh, in 1701 coming to Detroit. His uh, father was Italian. I think his mother was French. So uh, that's why he was uh, coming. 
Uh, my family was, came ar arrived in around the early 40s, I'd say. I'm trying to put that all together. Uh, it was there was eight kids in the family and grandma and grandpa, and they all came kind of in different uh, different times. Uh, there's also significant Italian presence in uh, the UP. Uh, some mining town. I have a really good friend, my best friend back in uh, DC. His mom grew up in Ishpeming, and uh, she's from Italy, and they, her family was mining family. Uh, and about, there's about almost 300,000 Italian Americans in the Detroit area. Italians to Canada. I'll give you a little background. Uh, about a million and a half Canadians uh, claim Italian ancestry, and again, more want to. Uh, but the first European to Canada was not John Cabot. <laughs> Giovanni Cabotto from Venezia. Okay, did everyone know that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, very few Italians, again, around the 1880s, very few. Most Italian immigration uh, between 1900, World War I. I think something happened with immigration laws then after World War I. Uh, and then there was more after World War II. And I'm getting that about 10% of a, uh, Windsor is Italian. Uh, and I have Canadian uh, Italian uh, cousins, uh, one in Peterborough and one in Nova Scotia. So I got to tell you about this picture. So we went to Rome in 2008. Kind of got off the train at an odd time. We were super hungry. There weren't very many restaurants open. We go to this restaurant. These two wonderful uh, waitresses are uh, served us well and gave us free limoncello. And uh, we had so much fun. And I read this book. And I'm in my really bad when I go on vacation. I like to read like books about Italy. And uh, so I, I don't know how we got it. And, uh, the girl on the right is, she's making me speak my really bad Italian, and then she said something. I said, well, where are you from? Oh, I was born in Toronto. <laughs> uh, her name's Damani, uh, so she was, uh, we had a great time. She was, uh, she was teaching English to the Italians. Uh, I didn't know this. I don't know if you knew that there was some internment uh, of Italians in World War II in Canada. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, so I learned this from my uh, cousin Berenice Angelina Pepe in uh, Peterborough, and uh, so she's telling me, did, and did you have you did you know about the Filia di Italia, a club uh, in it was throughout Canada, uh, Sons of Italy, and that's on sons and daughters, Filia. Uh, so uh, he would come to, from Peterborough to Windsor for different meetings, uh, she said. And uh, she said that no Italians were interned in Peterborough. She said the chief of police was a good friend or, you know, kind of spoke up for the Italians. But they were required to go to the uh, police office every month to, uh, I don't know, testify and uh, get photographed and fingerprinted. Uh, so I, I think I'm going to skip through this first part. Uh, if you are, have Italian ancestry, how many of you know your hometown? How many don't? Okay, this is what I find. Usually uh, Italians uh, in America, I'm betting in Canada, almost everyone knows their hometown. And I'm thinking it's because there's not too many generations between uh, the first immigrant and us. Uh, when I do German genealogy, like my mom, it's like, well, where are German people from? I have no idea. Germany. Uh, well, and that's typical. Most Germans don't know where they're from. So, uh, but most uh, Italians do. So this first part I wanted, this is really if you don't know, so I'm going to kind of brush through it fast. And if you don't know where your Italian town is, how to find it, uh, but I generally say, you know, collect all that family history stuff around the house, those funeral cards, uh, death certificates, you know, look on the census, marriage applications, marriage licenses, uh, death certificates, go to, the, go to the cemetery, look on the headstones, because sometimes 
the hometown is on there. So, uh, but our, our generally Italians know where we're from. Uh, something about Italian surnames. I was introduced to Infantor. My grandfather's Paolo Fornitaro. Grandma and Grandpa had eight kids, spoke very little English when they were having kids. They were basically off the boat. So they go register the births in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And this is what we get. Fantor, Fantero, Fornitaro, Fornitoro, Fernetti, Fernatori. Every kid got a different last name. Uh, so uh, one of the things you'll read about in, uh, for Italian Americans is that um, names were changed at Ellis Island. This is for Americans where primarily where Italians came to America, New York. Uh, names were not changed there. They, uh, there was no reason all they did was present their passport and they wrote down what they saw. So usually the, it was afterwards. My, uh, I have Cabot cousins, uh, Capazzoli is their real name, and we'll find a lot of Italian Americans, so there's been some change in the surname, sometimes due to World War I, due to World War II primarily. Uh, I like this one, Guglio Cielo to chill, uh, or Fornitaro to long, some of our Fornitaros change. Uh, so a lot of times this means we can't find our people in the index. So, but look for different spellings. The U.S. Census is a great source for finding out when people immigrated, uh, where they immigrated. Uh, I can never find my family again because there's, they spelled wrong, so I had to browse through. Uh, took me three days to, on the 1940 census. I had to just browse because I knew my people were in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and I couldn't find them there was in the index because it was wrong. Uh, so the census also gives us naturalization, or that's what we call when they gain their citizenship. Uh, I don't, does, does the Canadian census supply this kind of information? Yeah, they have the year of immigration. Okay. Okay, so that can be a good source. I, I always think we should get a good foundation in our uh, research on this side of the Atlantic compared to the, before we go to the other. Uh, for Italians coming to America, Ellis Island opened in 1892. Uh, we can look on there for index of manifests, uh, but generally now people are going to ancestry. Uh, and again, I can't say this enough, uh, try alternatives. Uh, you can also, a lot of times on the manifest, they'll have uh, the hometowns, um, oh, like um, my grandma's coming from Bella Squarta, there's like 12 Bella Squarta days, say, traveling with her, uh, have no idea who any of them are. No, we, we've actually connected now with some of them. Uh, and on the manifest, it would say, uh, who are you going to stay with? The name of, um, with two things, one is the uh, name of the closest relative back in Italy, who you're leaving, maybe a parent is there, maybe uh, a wife, uh, but also looking for destination in the U.S. records, where it will say, uh, they're going, like my grandfather was going to Crabtree, Pennsylvania. Who's there? Some Car Caranese cousins of his. So, this is what's on our, uh, uh, our records. Naturalization is a great process in the United States to find information. My grandfather applied for citizenship in 37 and I get the youngest picture I have of my grandfather. Uh, you're supposed to be able to speak English, you're supposed to be in the U.S. for five years, uh, and it has great information like where all the kids were born, where the wife was born, where he was born, when he came over, uh, great information. Same here? No. no. Not available? No naturalization records, no. Hmm. But Italians could become citizens? Yeah. Well, yeah. But the records aren't available. My okay. I have my father's okay. citizenship papers. Because he gave them to you. Is that right? He still had them. He still had them. Okay. You have to have them to get the pension. My oh. husband also 
so. Okay. 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 My mother, on the other hand, they just wrote her name on his paper along the co the, along the side. Okay. And similar. That women are so a little important. Wow. <laughs> well, interesting story there. In the United States, uh, the law was, uh, I think, until the 20s, that the woman had the citizenship status of her husband. Yeah. <laughs> so if she, if her husband became a citizen, mm -hmm. she was a citizen. However, if her husband, let me think how this goes, was, if she was American and she married an Italian and he was not a citizen, she was not a citizen. She'd lose her citizenship? Holy man. If she was born here. Yeah, in the U.S. Wow. So there's a lot. Of, that was changed. That was changed uh, because some people didn't, I'm sure they didn't like it. This is his naturalization app, or the first half of one page, of four pages of the application. It has his home birth, his birthplace, and it has my grandmother's birth, birthplace spelled wrong. But uh, that would certainly give us clues. Sometimes a marriage application can have some information on it, like, where were you born? Well, let's hope they got a little more specific than Italy. Uh, actually, in this one, what I got from this one, this marriage application, were the parents' names of my grandparents. So once you have your Italian hometown, you got to go to it. So that's me uh, a mile outside or a kilometer outside of my grandma's hometown of uh, Bella Squardo. Okay, so when we're talking Italian research, we need to know our province or our region. We need to know our comune, our town. Uh, so Italy became a nation in 1861. Really important for Italian research because a lot changed. Italy was not Italy before 1861. We had the kingdom of the two Sicilies. We had all these other things up north. Uh, but uh, so it, it, you really need to know your area so that you can do the research because every area of uh, Italy is a little different. Each province has its archives. And uh, so I took my nephew, he graduated from high school two years ago, and I took my uh, sister and brother-in-law to Italy. And uh, I, so we went one day to Amalfi, and I said, okay, now you know how to get on the boat. Tomorrow you're going to Capri. I've already been, I'm going to the archives. What do we want to do, right? We want to research. You can't research with other people at a library or archives. So uh, I learned that all this, the Italian, when they were making civil records, they would always send a duplicate book to the archives. So you got your hometown, what are you gonna do? I recommend writing. And this is what I did. Uh, I'm gonna say around 1999, I think I sent my first letters to Italy. And you search for, you know, the postal code and you send it. There are some great letter writing forms in books. I don't know if you know Trafford Cole's book on Italian genealogy or uh, just go to Cindy's list and they've got great letter writing or at the Family History Library, familysearch.org, uh, their research guide is excellent. You know, it, it will explain what, how you can write to Italy. What you're going to do is tell them what you know, like my grandfather was born in 1890, based on my U.S. research, and you're going to request a situazione di famiglia. Uh, you write in Italian, but you got this, again, they've got these form letters. Uh, so you can just, uh, it'll say, you know, like my grandfather was born in Trieste in such and such a year, and I want, I want to know more information about his family. They'll give you that. I don't, I did not grow up speaking Italian. My Italian's pretty bad. I can read it now, genealogical Italian, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not good with Italian. Uh, no, re no reason to send money. My last 20 bucks was returned to me. Uh, but they don't usually provide copies of the records. Okay, they're going to extract it and send you that extracted information. And there's nothing like getting mail from Italy. 
By the way, yep. when my sister-in-law's mother died, I sent money for flowers. Uh huh. She never cashed it because it cost her so much to cash it, she ended up with half the money. Uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe that's why they send it back to you. Okay. <laughs> This is what the situazione me, uh, looks like. Uh, cognome and nome, that's surname and name. Uh, the date and place of the nascita, the birth. It, it gives the uh, birth dates, the status, uh, their status. The, the first two are married, the other one is uh, celibate or single. Uh, so we got a husband, a wife, and a son. And it says that my uh, great grandfather died at Laviano on this su such and such a date. And uh, it also had that my grandfather Paolo emigrated. So, this is the kind of information you can get when you write Italy. So, when I write my Bella Squarta, my grandma's hometown, they say the, uh, the uh, Stato Civile says to me, well, by the way, your cousin Amelia lives at 33, Via Emanuel, and she wants you to write her. This is my dad's first cousin. Okay? So I made contact, wrote her, got in touch with her son and grandson, and by the time I got to Bella Squardo, she had passed away. But uh, it was still, uh, this was her house, so. Ah, we thank Napoleon for Italian records. Uh, Napoleon was uh, emperor of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which included southern Italy and Sicily. And he instituted civil registration, uh, not church records, civil, uh, in 1809 for southern Italy. Uh, these records are rich in genealogical information. They're the basis. They are what the folks in the Stato Civile office looked at to write that Stato di Familia. Uh, that's what they used. And if you're not Italian, the, this kind of Napoleon was all over. This is also used in France. I've seen French records. They look the same. Uh, and there are also other parts, like if you were in Alsace, part of Germany, you might find these kind of records. Uh, Russia. Uh, so we thank Napoleon for these records. And there's nothing like holding 200 year old records, especially if they're your people. So I was in Bella Squardo. I'm in the records room. The lady, uh, lady left me look at me. She, oh, you know what you're doing. It's like, oh yeah. And uh, so I'm holding this record, death record of my grandmother's grandmother, Maria Bastola. The next day, we go to Amalfi. What do I see? The Bastola dress shop. So I go in there in my really bad Italian. La mia, fi uh, mia familia uh, Bastola di Bella Squardo. Di Bella Squardo? Si, si. Cousins. Cousins. So always look for your surname. It could be, it, it could be your cousins. Okay, birth records. So Napoleon started to use records in 1809, and they are civil records. Again, not church records. They'll have that the kid was born, the time of, uh, they'll have the date of birth. They will have, so, oh, sometimes they have the time. They will have where the child was born. They will give you the address. And uh, sometimes, in different periods, they go through kind of, we're, I'm thinking of 100 years of these, like say from 1809 to, to 19, there, so there are changes at different times, but uh, sometimes the baptism information is on the side of the record. The births were rec uh, recorded at the Stato Civile or Anagrafe, uh, the civil, what we call the records office. Uh, it was always to be the day of or the day after the child's birth. Usually the birth was reported by the father. Uh, not all the times. It, this is kind of confusing. You're reading this record and it's like, well, why am I reading Ana Lupo? There should be a man here. Uh, Ana Lupo was my uh, ancestor and she was an obstetrice. She was a midwife. 
So sometimes the midwife would report the birth. And you'll find this word presentado. They actually brought the baby down to the office and registered the birth. They want, exactly, they wanted, you know, they want, it was a witness thing. You know, am I going to take your uh, word that you had a baby last night? No. Uh, you got to show me. Okay. So they, uh, you'll read this word, officiale, the, the official. They had to, you had to present the baby to the mayor. This is a birth record. Uh, I, I gave this to you. I, if you want to uh, agonize over um, this, uh, I, I think it's worthwhile that we look at this. Could I get a copy of that, please? Thank you. Okay, the one we are going to look at is the last one. Looks like number 12 on the side. This is a typical. This is the way these records start. L'anno 1890 ari primo di aprile a ore ante meridiano nove e minute quaranta. So what they're saying in the year 1890, like why didn't they just write numbers? Uh, on the 1st of April, at the hour afternoon, Nove, this is basically Nove at 9 at night, 9.40, at the Casa Comunale, City Hall. They're at the uh, Anagrafe office, or Stato uh, Civile, and they're at, they're at this office. Avante de me, Carlo Marimo, Sindaco. So, Carlo Marmo is the uh, mayor in this small town. This is a town of about 700 people, so the mayor is actually doing the records at this time. And someone's appearing before me. He, and he's the official of the Dello Stato Civile del Comune di Bellasquardo. He's in charge of the civil records for the town of Bellasquardo. E comparso, Croce, Luigi. So here we have Luigi Croce. She is 43, quaranta tre, and she's, okay, here's another word for midwife, levatrice. Oh, in one town I think I get obstetrice or levatrice, Mid, basically it's the midwife. Uh, so she's reporting the birth, and she lives in Domiciliato in Bellasquardo, and she's saying, adichierato, that at the hour pomeridiano, after uh, 10, or afternoon, at 10.50, uh, on the 30th of the prior month, so in March, this is an unusual record because it's two days after the birth. A little unusual there. Uh, and she's saying that Cinquanta uh, della Trenta, Mese nel Casa Post, they lived on Via Palazzo, Palazzo Vecchio, at numero 18, at 18 via Palazzo Vecchio, uh, to Serafina Valletta. Uh, she's a farmer, contadina, and she's wife of Luigi Pepe, the barbieri, barber, and they both live together in Bellasquardo. E nato un bambino di sesso femminile. Uh, uh, mi presenta a cui nome del Fiorenta. So she's presenting the baby, it's a feminine a girl, and they gave her the name of Fiorenta. Any questions on this? This is a birth record. Okay, sometimes it's different areas, different regions, different towns, they will not be on a form. Those are more difficult to read. They're written out like in paragraph form. Difficult to read, but they follow the same format. So I'm gonna say you can't forget this. You gotta remember your format and uh, the, the records are, are gonna be the same. 
Uh, and just to tell you, on the side, sometimes you get this little extra information. On the side of this birth record, it's saying she got married in 1918 uh, to Sabado uh, Rashaniti, and it gives her uh, 1918, uh, May 22nd. So sometimes they will put the marriage record, sometimes they'll put the death information on the birth record. So, any questions on birth records? We, we thank Napoleon all the time, and there'll be a test at the end of the day, so I'll help you remember it all. I'll do that. Yeah? Is that the surname of this child? Um, uh, are you on the right-hand side? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, last name is Pepe. Her first name is Fiorita, and then it says Di Luigi. So, it's of Luigi. A, a big thing in Italian records is a lot of times the person is introduced uh by the father's name so she's fiorinta daughter of luigi is what's on that right hand side so again these birth records follow a certain format l'anno in the year mille one thousand ottocento eight hundred so if you learn your numbers you, you got it you got it made uh, Avante de me, Nicola Pepe, appeared before me, uh, comparsa uh, Luigi, uh, the midwife says. Uh, so it follows this, this format, a baby was born, they'll usually give the, the sex of the baby and who the baby was born to. Anyone got an ancestor with the last name of Esposito? Okay, if you do, you will find out that Esposito means deposited at the orphanage. So there will be a record, it might have uh, the mother's name, it might not list the father, it might, might say Padre Incerto, uncertain. Usually, in a town of 700 people, usually you knew who it was, but they just didn't write that. Interesting story, if you want to research it, is Sophia Loren had this kind of uh, situation. Uh, she and her sister, everyone knew who her father was, but he didn't claim them. He was a married guy. And uh, so uh, she writes about this. So it's in, kind of interesting if you read about Sophia Loren. Then how about Phil Esposito? The hockey player. I'm betting he it's somewhere along his line. That's the question. Somewhere mm -hmm. on that, yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, let me see anything I didn't say. Uh, I mean, this is usually a child born out of wedlock. Uh, oftentimes the father was known, but they didn't say. I'd oh, like to, yeah. if I may, say, yeah. my mother was adopted. Uh huh. And um, Flavius told me that Claini was one of those common names. Ah, other than Esposito. Yes. That, that served the same purpose. My husband's sister-in-law in Italy, my brother's wife, took me to Udine City Hall because her cousin worked there. Mm -hmm. In Italy, everything takes time. Yeah. He was back in a minute to tell me, I cannot tell you the name of your grandparents. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Death records in Italy uh, provides information on the place of death, time of death, who died. Always registered the day of the death or the day after. Uh, and there's been changes through the years. In the beginning <coughs> years, they didn't require so much information. Like you might not get parents on death records from this uh, or from the early times. Uh, but a lot of times it has a street address, uh, occupation, burial information. Uh, there will be two informants because instead of bringing the, remember, birth records, they brought the body down. They brought the baby down. You don't have to do that with death records. But to prove it, you needed two witnesses. Okay? Confusing thing about Italian death records. We expect maybe like our person who died is going to be one of the first three people mentioned in the record. Not so. 
The mayors first, and then two witnesses. They come to report that so-and-so died. Uh, usually it provides the name of the spouse, not always, uh, and that the parents, whether they were still living. The word fu, F-U, forono, means deceased or late. So if you see that on a record, it says uh, Luigi uh, Filio, Filio di uh, Michele, uh, Fu Michele, that means Michele is deceased. However, if there is a lack of a food, that doesn't mean they're alive. Sometimes the clerk, you know, didn't put it in. Uh, sometimes we're not so good at it. So if, they're, if it's there, you know they were deceased. But if it's not there, you don't know that they were alive. Um, usually the information about the deceased parents, age, birthday, birthplace, sometimes that will be inaccurate. Like, as we know with uh, death records in the US or Canada, if they report on the, when the person was born, it may not be right. You know, it's, it's 87 years after the person was born. No one who uh, was an informant on that death record was there at the birth of that person. So it might be incorrect. Uh, Italian women keep their last names. Don't look for who you, their married name. Uh, when I was a, a librarian at the Family History Center in Annandale, there was this lady doing French research. Same stuff, same records. She says, I can find all the men dying. I can't find any of the women. They don't die. So we had to tell her, uh, look for their maiden names. Uh, then she found them. So, uh, one thing is Italian death records generally do not say the cause of death. We like to see that, but we don't get it. This is a death record. It is going to follow the same general format. This is an oldie. This is the true Napoleonic records. This one's from 1811. Starts the same way, just a little different word. Oggi, today. Uh, che sono i 22 del mese di settembre del anno 1811. So on the September 21st of uh, 1811, at the hour 11, at the 11th hour, avante di noi, incaricato del registro degli atti dello Stato Civile, sono comparso. So Vincenzo Fornataro, Diani, 50. Uh, two things here. Um, uh, let me see. Sometimes uh, I always find these uh, the ages of the witnesses or the ages of the parents are often estimated. So they may say they're 50, but when you look at their record, you're going to find, oh, he was really 53. So these ages on death records of not the deceased, but of the witnesses, are often incorrect. Uh, and it says, uh, so Vincenzo, F oh, Fornic I'm sorry, Fornicola, Diani Cinquanta, Bracciale, I'll come back to that word in a minute, Domiciliato in questa commune of Coliano, who lives on Strada Costa, and uh, Cosmo Cavallo, Diani Trenta, Bracciale, Domiciliato, Nello, so they both live on the same street, and they've told me, uh, they've declared that the more there was a death of Paolo Fornataro, he was one year old, and he's the son of Pasquale Fornataro. Generally, the death records follow this format. A little later, they're going to uh, actually have a lot more information, uh, but generally, they're going to follow this format. We get rid of OG about 1815. Any questions on death records? Marriage records, acti de matrimonio. Civil officials recorded the marriages. Uh, they're usually in, in these pre-printed forms. We like these pre-printed forms because that gives us structure for translation. Once you learn the form, then you just learn what, how they fill it in. 
Uh, it should give the date of the marriage license. I'm gonna, and the names of the bride and groom. It'll indicate whether they were single or widowed. Uh, it sh and it should give names of witnesses. Uh, we'll include other information about the bride and groom as far as birthplace, residence, occupation, names of parents. In cases of the second or later marriages, the uh, name of the deceased spouse should be in that record. Uh, and it may include the uh, date of the church ceremony. So if you would look at the marriage record. These are my great grandparents. L'anno 1885 ad il 26 di novembre, a ore pomeridiano. So again, they're just given the time, the date and the time. Nella casa comunale, comunale, city hall. Uh, di Coliano, this is the town. Avante di me, this is the mayor or the ufficiale dello stato civile. Uh, and he's the, the official. Uh, and he's, so, uh, he's saying that this one, they're getting fancy. They're writing, uh, they're giving us numbers. Giovanni Fornataro. Look at the word after that one. Giovanni Fornataro. Vedovo. He was a widower. Really important when we're doing our family history to, to see if they were married before or not. And he's 46. And he's a contadino farmer. And he was born in Coliano resides in Coliano. He's the filio of Fu Leone, the late Leone, uh, who, who lived in Coliano, and the late Mariana Santa Luce, resident, they lived in Coliano. The bride is number two, Rosario Giorgio. Uh, Nubile, she's not been married, uh, even though she is trained to Trenta Cinque, she's 35 and a contadina. Uh, she was born in Coliano. She resides in Coliano. She's the daughter of Paolo, who resides in Coliano, and Maria Giuseppe Caranese, who resides in Coliano. So, this is a typical marriage record. This is 1885. But if you, if you looked at all the records of your towns, like from 1809 to 1900, You'd see some variations in the records, but generally they're going to be like this. Any questions on the marriage record? Yes, sir. These records, did you pick them up in, during your visits in Italy, or did they send those to you? Uh, two ways. Uh, three ways. I uh, got some pictures when I went to Bella Squardo. My grandfather's hometown is a little bigger, Coliano, and it's not indexed, and it, I didn't have enough time to go through them. But in Bella Squared, it was relatively small, so I was able to get some pictures there. Went to the archives for both towns in Salerno, the city of Salerno, and I was able to get copies there. And I'm gonna save the last part till two more slides or so, okay? Uh, we have these wonderful records in Italy uh, called Procesetti. So before you were going to get married, you had to prove that you were eligible to get married. You had to prove that you were old enough. So what record would they need? Birth, birth. birth record. Or if we're, let's say you got married in 1810, so there were no birth records like uh, 1790, where would you go? Church. Church. They would go to the church, they'd pay the priest or someone to extract the record and then you had to bring that copy down to uh, Casa Comunale, and you needed to prove, you know, here's my birth record, just like we would go get our birth record. Um, oh, we, you almost wish for it like the father of the bride and groom to be deceased, because then you get their death record in the Procesetti. Because in Italy, you were to give your permission for your son or daughter to marry, and if if you were deceased, you could not do that. So you had to provide the death record. So that uh, so it's all easy if the family was in Bellasquardo the whole time, and you just okay, my grandma's death or grandpa's death record I need, or you know that. But if you were in that, you know, say you were born 
20 miles away. You had to go 20 miles away and go get that death record. Uh, what else? It may have the testimony of the grandparent or the permit where they give permission. Uh, and again, if they had a former spouse, the former spouse's death record needed to be in these. These are, it's usually like about 10 pages of documents that they needed. It is usually extracted or estrado. So someone was doing handwriting because they didn't have a copier at the time. And they, they did that uh, uh, extracting. It's a little more difficult to read, but generally they're gonna follow the same format. The baptismal records will often be in Latin. How's everyone's Latin? Yeah, I know, I wish. Uh, great uh, little, they're almost little books. Ten, usually you get about 10 pages of records in the Procesetti. How many people does this apply to? No parlo italiano. Okay? Okay, I am here to tell you that once you learn what these forms say, and I... I'm sure everyone's going to remember all this today. Uh, once you know what the forms say, you can follow along. Learn the numbers, learn the months, learn your how to say a year in Italian. Mille, ottocento, novante, tre. And there's all these genealogical words that are uh, repeated all the time. Uh, padre. Uh, we know our genealogical words. The Family History Library at FamilySearch.org has an excellent Italian word list. I've also seen them at um, Cindy's list. Uh, so once you learn, there's about, I'm going to say, 50 to 100 words you need to know. And then, you know, it's... Uh, 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 it, then it's not so difficult. It takes you a little practice, but once you get kind of how, how these records are, if you remember, the first people at, at the top of the record are going to be the mayor. If it's a death record, it's going to be the witnesses. Birth record, it's going to be the uh, obstetrice or levitrice and, or the father. And for marriage records, it's usually both the bride and the groom came to the town or to the city hall. So uh, I'm reading, uh, you know, most of my people, Contadina. Bracciale is a word, at least in this part of Italy, southern Italy, it meant he was a farm worker, but not for his own farm. He was farming for someone else. So let me just tell you about a, a great book and a great movie. 1861, Italy became a country. Anyone uh, seen the movie or read the book, The Leopard by Lampedusa? This is a Visconti movie. It's a beautiful art picture movie uh, from 1963. Uh, it tells the story of uh, Burt Lancaster uh, is the uh, Don. Uh, he's the head of the villa in, in Sicily. He's the rich guy. If you weren't a rich guy, you were basically a, a, a serf. It was, it was basically feudalism. You had to get permission to leave the villa. You, you, you were born there, you're going to die there. And the Don or Dona had, had basically uh, rule over your life. Uh, so a really good book talked about the changes in Italy in this family. Was, they were going to have big changes because what happened was agriculture or land reform. And then our people started, uh, I'm counting my people, our poor, uh, we were able to start buying land. So... Uh, good book uh, and great movie, uh, uh, The Leopard. But I'm reading, uh, so one of my records for my, I'm reading the, or my, uh, the occupation of my ancestor, uh, Agostino Longo, was Orlog, I'm going to say it badly, Orologayo, clockmaker. And we're not talking clocks like that clock. We're talking, you know, every Italian town usually has a, a, a big square and maybe one tower, maybe it has a clock on it. That's what my ancestor, his job was. So they didn't do this. I mean, Bellas Quarters got one clock tower, so you, after that was built, you didn't need to build anymore. So they were going to these different towns. 
But I was able to find that in a list of occupations, a list of Italian occupations. So that there are these great resources on the internet for Italian words, Italian genealogy words, and Italian occupations. Here, you know, I could test you on these and uh, you could tell me already what all these words are. Uh, but there's, there's not that many different, you know, 50 to 100, I'm going to say, words that you need to know. Let's see if there's anything we haven't talked about. I think we've done pretty good there. So, Italian church records. We would love to that this, these be available. Uh, so when I was in uh, Salerno, I saw this um, museo of the diocese. Uh, and someone was telling me, you can go there. They may not have the, the records from the town, but you never know. Uh, I have found church records from Italy on the Family History Library catalog. Some of the churches in Italy have been transcribed. Uh, but basically, I think if you want Italian church records, you're going to have to get a researcher or go do it. My Bella Scordese cousin in uh, Peterborough, we're talking about maybe going in September or October. Uh, she knows more Italy than, or more Italian than me. Yes, sir. Um, Italy in recent years passed some strict privacy uh, laws. Do you find that getting records uh, a lot harder now than years ago? No, easier. Really? Yep. I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm just going to tell you about my friend Ricardo. Uh, he went, his people were from Molise on the other side of Italy, what I call the other side. Uh, and he goes there. He's, gonna, he's got all his family history research. He's been doing uh, a lot, I don't by different methods. I think his towns were microfilmed, the civil records. He goes there. He asks the priest, you know, can I, in his bad Italian, can I look at the, the records? They're over there. He says well, there's like, you know, 500 years of church records in books over here. And he's just like freaking out because they're going to be lost to posterity if someone doesn't take care of these records. He was able to, to get into the church. I have heard challenging, challenging stories where you try to get the church records and you can't. So it, it, it is a challenge. So that's why I think you need, if you're going to do church records research before 1809, you're really either going to need to do it yourself or find a, a researcher to do it. Family History Library, look, look in the library for your town. This is my Calabrian uh, client. His people were from Acre. They had all the civil records for Acre, uh, right from the Family History Library. I just got it through a uh, microfilm and was able to use those. Yeah. So um, the, the civil records that I've been talking about starting in 1809 through about, I'm going to say 1885, were available. This is the, uh, a, sh a shot from the uh, familysearch.org. If you go in the catalog and uh, I just put in Acre, and I get uh, that uh, there are, you know, manuscripts or microfilm available. It's all in Italian. Uh, it's from Salt Lake. And I worked at the Family History Center, so I, so yep. Do you have to be a member or do you have to sign up? Or no, it's just, okay. no, all free. Now, I understand that, uh, do you have a family history library in this area? Yeah. I understand that a lot, they are not doing microfilm anymore. That is, okay. Yeah. So they are digitizing all their records. Uh, so I don't know how this is working now. Uh, my people's records are somewhere else. They're not on here. Yeah, I was waiting 20 years, you know, to get them. And uh, we got the archives. Uh, I even was able to, at some point, I got a researcher from the Salerno archives, I would tell her what I wanted. And for 12 euros, I'd get like 10 records. Uh, it was a deal. So that might be available. Look for your archive online and you may be able to find a researcher to do research there. It was very reasonable. 
I mean, I think all of us, you know, 12 Italian records, we would, yes, yes ma'am. So region of Italy, is that the province that you have to know? Okay, so I'm uh, going to think of my geographical terms. Uh, so like for my, no. my place is Salerno. I'm think uh, that is a region, isn't that? So Tuscany is a region, and it would include like Amalfi, Capri, all those areas. It's a region. Yeah. Okay. So I think we wanted. I think we're. I'm. I think I'm talking provinces. Provinces. Yes. Provinces. Thank you. So Salerno is a province, and they have their own archives. Avellino has an archives. Uh, Lazio has an archives. Uh, so find your archives, they're online. Uh, so I was able to, with my uh, Fornataro family, with this researcher, I was able to push back three, four generations. Okay, there are so many Italian websites. When I started 20 years ago, there was nothing. Uh, so Ancestry has some Italian records. Cindy's List, look there, look for your region, look for your province. Uh, a lot of the Italian towns have their own websites. Uh, I'm going to tell you about two groups on Facebook. Uh, if you're on Facebook, there is the Southern Italian Genealogical Group, something like that, and the Italian Genealogical Group. So what people are doing is, uh, I'll post a record and I'll say, I can't read this record. Can someone tell me? Or what's that word before, you know, uh, or... Uh, People will ask for translations, and there are such experts on there, like in 10 minutes, you've got your record translated. So, uh, but I use Google Translate. Ah, I, I was talking to someone here, uh, all of us from different parts of Italy, if we were to talk in our uh, town's dialect, we would not be able to talk to each other, okay? So, uh, Google Translate works okay, depending on your area of Italy. It's not great. Uh, but find the other Italian researchers. I think it's a, these uh, groups on Facebook are just wonderful. But when I was at the Family History Center in Annandale, Virginia, not as an ethnic area like this area, you know, there was only four of us Italians researching. And, but we formed a group and we taught our, each other, you know, what does this mean? You know, what is that? What, this is a great book. Uh, so we learned from others. This is the candy store for us. Uh, there is a website called Antonati. This is the archives for the entire Italian country. And then it breaks down in, by area and uh, by region, by town. They are digitizing all of those, all those birth, death, and marriage records that I told you about since 1809. They're digitizing. And all the towns are not complete yet, but one day I was like, okay, I got everything up to 1865. Uh, I looked the next day, 1866 is on, you know? Uh, so it's, it's that fast where they are coming. Uh, and if you ask on, on those two groups on Facebook, if you ask, hey, where's my records? Uh, someone will say, oh, they're not on there yet, or they're on there. Uh, so this is the website, and they have all those records that we were talking about available. They break them into three groups, Napoleonic from 1809 to 1820, 1821 to 1865 is Restoration, and 1866 to... <coughs> This is, uh, every town is different where they're ending, uh, but those are now uh, Italian records because it's Italy after 1860. For these records, it was after 1865. So uh, the, this is free. This is, uh, so tonight, this is your homework to go to Antonati and look for your hometown. Yes? I've been using this quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. But they have um, some kind of um, volunteers research. Do you have any um, knowledge about that at all? Is Do that, are they know? looking for people to index? Yeah. Okay. They're, they're not, the parts that aren't completed, 
they you can go in and volunteer. I don't I don't know much about it. I didn't look into that. I was just wondering. Yeah, I haven't uh, because I have work to do. Uh, I got my genie. You know, I want to keep doing some research, so I haven't volunteered for anything. But a typical thing would be making indexes. Mm -hmm. Some of the years I'm finding uh, I was working with. I was teaching my cousin uh, Berenice in Peterborough, I was teaching her about these records. And um, uh, she, uh, oh, what were we just, what was your question? About the volunteer. Oh, yes. So uh, I was teaching her about the, the, if you look at the last record in this town, the last record was the Indice or the index. Okay. And so some years have it, some don't. Uh, but look for the index first before you go through every record. And I'm going to just say as an old time microfilm reader, I can do microfilm much faster than uh, changing images online. It, it can be slower. Uh, so, but uh, great, great website. Uh, brings us right to the town, brings us to these records. Not the easiest site to navigate. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a great, great resource. Uh, I'm a big, uh, I have uh, Facebook pages for uh, my Pepe family and my Fornataro family, and we discuss family history issues. We find a new Pepe or a new Fornataro, we bring them into the group, and uh, we talk uh, family history. Uh, I'm, you know, friends with my Italian second cousins uh, back in Italy. And they're part of the group, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, but again, that Southern Italian genealogy group and the Italian genealogy, yeah, Italian genealogy group are great help. Uh, and again, what people are doing is they just bring a link into the, uh, the Facebook group and they say, you know, can some people give me uh, some help with this uh, record, this link, and people do. So uh, you need to go to Italy and meet your second cousins. Uh, we did uh, last in 2000, this was 2008, but in 2015, the, uh, got my cousin Luigi in the NYPD uh, t-shirt, uh, he had worked in New York, he had really good English, and we had dinner with him in Rome. So it was really nice. Feel free to contact me. I love to help people, I love to coach. I like to tell you what to do. So, yes, sir. So, Antonati, all these records, the civil records are, are on there. Uh, they are, I wonder, you know, like we have our privacy rules too. Uh, like in the U.S., you can't get a census record for 72 years. Uh, if you're not part of the family, you can't get a birth record. Death records are generally, anyone can get them. Uh, I think marriage records anyone can get. So there's there's privacy rules, but I, I can spend hours on Antonati and there's, I think it's because they're so old. Though I think the uh, most recent records that I've seen on Antonati, 1920s maybe. So most of those people would be deceased. So I don't know what the, exactly their privacy rule is, but uh, Antonati has changed the world of Italian genealogy. Any questions? I have one. Yes. So with all the civil records, the birth, marriages, and deaths, you were saying within a day or two, was there any repercussion for them not making the deadline of a day or two? Oh, good question. And I don't know the, ah, something I need to research. I don't know. Uh, it, it's so interesting. I found only two, I think, uh, my, this is my great aunt, Fiorenta, where hers was two days after. So I'm with my cousin uh, Bernie in uh, Peterborough, and we're looking at her dad's 1903 record. It was done four days after, which was really unusual. So I don't know. Maybe it was over a long weekend kind of thing. You know, and it could have been a hot, let me, Christmas. yeah, yeah. Or maybe the mayor was out of town or you know, something. I, there, I bet there was an explanation yeah, for like it. Sometimes if a child was born sickly and not able to, you know, for... You know, and wouldn't you think that for a, like yeah. a, a, the baby right born is you'd be afraid to take it out, <laughs> you know? But uh, they had to bring the baby down. Mm -hmm. Risentado. Mm -hmm. 
Here right. in our this library, they have a section that's genealogy. Uh huh. We know. They have a lot of records. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell me? I have Alberona, Ogia, Capitana, Italy. I have three names. What are the one? One is the region. The first one, right? Uh, I am betting Alberona is Comune. I'm betting Foggia is the province, and I'm thinking Capitanata is the region. Well, I know there's a town, Foggia. Oh, a town. So Alberona, maybe sometimes uh, you will see in the record, sometimes it'll say, uh, today this is in San Pietro, or uh, where, where the records of the town used to make the records, but now they don't make their own. They've kind of combined with the town next to them. Okay. So, what would that last word be then? Uh, Capitanata? Yeah. I, I, have you Googled it? I, I, anyone familiar with Capitanata? I know Foggia is a province. But there is a town that. Uh, that name too. It is. Yeah. So is Capitanato like Cosenza? But like, or? Google it. Well, when I Googled Foggia, I got pictures of the downtown. So it is a town. Mm -hmm. Or was. It mm -hmm. was bombed in World War II extensively. Oh. So I haven't been able to find any records. So I'm hoping that what you So tonight you're going to go to Antonati. One region will be. You know the region you need to like last year will be your this will be yours Foggia and Pipuli because Foggia is a province. If yeah. there's a town it might be a different region, so you have to find that out. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that could have been my yeah. problem now. I, I think you're gonna uh, I think you're gonna have some success on this tonight. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm hoping to go to Italy this later this year. Do I go, do I start with the church records or do I start with, um, it's Lazio, is there a problem? Mm -hmm. Do I go to there? I would go to Antonati first and do all your research. Do the civil records first because that, when was your parents born about? Oh, they are, um, 19... Okay, so hopefully your noni are gonna you're gonna find their maybe marriage record or their birth records. Uh, I think it's gonna be too early on Antonati to get your parents' records. Might be. I don't. I've never. Uh, no, they won't be. I don't think those are on there. I, they have all their records. Okay. I so if and parents. you know your grandparents' names. I know my grandparents' names. About when they were born. Going back. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please, we would like a reminder that the library will be closing in 30 minutes. If you need a library card, please come to the checkout desk on the first floor now. Thank you. One thing you're going to hope for is an Indice Deciano Anuale 10 year uh, index. So, like for births later, like say in the <laughs> 1880s, 1890s, they would do an index for all. You don't know what year they are born? They'll have a 10-year index. Not always. You want to hope for that. Uh, but that might be a big help to you. Or the more you can narrow down the birth years for your noni, uh, you'll, you'll be able to find those records. Thank you. Any other questions? Grazie. Great. Thank you. Thank you.